So yeah, welcome everybody to this, the first Sipsi Southwest event of the year. I'm Gonzalo Pastor. I'm a member of the Sipsi Southwest committee and I work for Holy in the Bristol office. So this this event is as is a series of three of three, it has three sessions basically and we are going to be talking about the present and future of offset fabrication applied to building services and today we're going to focus more on the a high level overview of the existing MEP products and also the considerations to be had in the design and the current design construction workflow so there's a bit of our housekeeping well at the moment you are automatically on mute and the, with, without the camera. So it's quite a lot of content that we need to go through. Uh, there is going to be a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, please write it on the chat and I will be moderating that at the end. And it might be that if we have time at the end during that Q&A session, we probably, if somebody wants to ask a question more direct, just raise your hand and we probably unmute you so you can ask the question directly. And Next one, Neil, please. Yeah, so this is the first session, which, as I mentioned before, there are other two sessions which are next Thursday and the following Thursday. So next Thursday, we'll be talking about the future of offsite fabrication applied to the construction sector and the benefits of implementing product-based solutions for the, from the beginning of the design stage. To be honest, I think we are all quite passionate about that session. And then the, the third session is more about focus more on the engineering and innovation in the fabrication installation stages. So now I'm going to hand over to our speakers, who are Neil Ross and Joe Lally. Neil. Okay, uh, thanks Gonzalo. Um, <clears throat> I suppose as, as uh, well, firstly, good afternoon everybody. I hope, hope you're all well. I think there's some, um, some people in the call that um, I remember from quite a long time ago, and equally there's some uh, people in the call that, that I work with more closely more recently, so nice to see a, a broad range of people that, that I recognise, but equally for those that I don't recognise, um, uh, welcome to, to this session. Um, I won't go into detail in terms of my introduction, it's, it's on screen, but myself and, and Joe, we work for Langer Orc and we will be presenting this series of talks to you. Um, we're, we're really pleased to have been invited to deliver this series of talks um, and we hope that they'll provide you with some interest and insight around our a methodology which um, for Langer Ork is, is key to our business, but equally from Joe and my perspective, it's something that, that, that we're interested in and passionate about too. During the session, Joe and I plan on providing you with an overview of the offsite fabrication applied to the building services. Um, I'm sure you'll appreciate that it's a subject of incredible depth um, and also complexity. So we're intentionally keeping that at a high level given the time we've got available during this afternoon session. I think there was an hour and a half on the, the time slot. We probably won't get close, well, it's likely we won't get close to that, but we will, we're leaving some time for questions and answers at, at the end, uh, should that be appropriate. Um, so we'll close with that, um, where we look forward to receiving your comments. So just a little bit of a, uh, an overview in terms of who we are, in, uh, in case you don't know. Um, so Langer Orc is a, it's a privately owned international engineering enterprise. We've got world class capabilities spanning the whole of the client value chain. Um, our mission is to become the recognised leader for innovation and excellence in the construction sector. We have a mature digital engineering and design for manufacturing and assembly offer. We strive to improve productivity and profitability and we're continually developing with innovation and sustainability as a key focus. Those are, those are words that are coming from our group chief executive, Ray O'Rourke, who's um, pictured on, on, on this slide. Our manufacturing capability stretches across four manufacturing locations in the Midlands. We've got a, a graphic in the bottom right to illustrate where those are. Our centre of excellence for a modern construction facility at Explore Industrial Park and Worksop um, is actually the most automated concrete products facility in Europe. And if you do get the chance to go and visit it, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's very impressive. We've also got a GRC manufacturing facility in Doncaster, where we manufacture um, architecturally biased um, uh, facade panels out of glass reinforced concrete. Um, if you get a chance to visit the Tottenham Court Road um, Crossrail station when that opens, all the, the internal 
uh, cladding of the, the tunneling is being done out of that facility. We have a volumetric facility in Manton Wood, um, which largely caters towards our internal partitioning system, bathroom pods and utility cupboards, and also some of our um, tech hall products, which we'll, we will come on to later on in the presentation. Last but not least, we've got our m and &E facility in Albury, um, which is actually this year celebrating its 25th year in operation. Um, again, um, if you, you have the chance to come and visit us um, at our facility in Albury, equally for the other ones, and then we'd be more than happy to, to take you around and um, let you let you learn from from our experiences. Um, Langer Orchid is it's a large company. It's a global company. We've got some business data on the, the bottom left hand side. Um, clearly, we're we're motivated to to drive change into the the construction industry. Just before we really get going, I just wanted to touch on terminology. Um, when we talk about DFMA, what that actually refers to is the process. So the process is known as design for manufacture and assembly, kind of written short and as DFMA, but we mustn't forget the operational side. It's not part of the, the terminology, but it absolutely is front and centre of the, the, uh, the process because we need to make sure that when we, when we deploy a process, we're, we've got the right requirements in mind for that. The actual products that come out of the process, we term as off-site MEP products. I'm, I'm sure there'll be other terminologies which other people will use, but from our perspective, that's that's what we refer to, and that's what the slide deck will, will really talk, talk around. So I think when, when people think of off-site manufacturing, um, they commonly think that its application will limit architectural flair and design flexibility. I don't, I don't know if that's um, a sort of thought that you would have had in mind before you attended this presentation. Um, I guess a lot of people would, would think that we'd a DFMA process would realise a Soviet style, brutalist architectural form, um, such as what you can see on screen. So, so not really giving the, 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 the design flair which, which a lot of our um, projects require. Um, or, or indeed, um, when it comes to DFMA and, and off-site manufacture, potentially the port cabin style solution is, is where your mind would draw towards. But actually, the, the, the truth is quite the opposite. So DFMA is actually about standardising components and defining interfaces to remove the interfacing risk within the design space and also in delivery. And Lego is perhaps one of the best examples of this where they've actually developed a range of standardised blocks um, which all have a, a standardised way of interfacing with each other, which is repeated on each and every component part. So this enables designers to create complex bespoke design solutions. And we have a saying that DFMA is standardizing the invisible and customizing the visible. So in effect, the DFMA process supports design teams by enabling them to spend their energy and effort where it's best placed, not in recasting repeatable design details time and time again. So I guess if we think about this from a, an ME system design perspective, we, we would look to try and standardise the components that build up the whole. So the whole has got an element of bespokeness to it using the standardised um, approach. Let me just refresh myself a moment. <clears throat> so using a DFMA process can actually surface a number of benefits. I've listed five on screen. There's, there's no doubt more than this. Um, the, the, the process does drive a mindset of standardization and repeatability into designs um, with key component parts of the m &E systems being developed once and reconfigured to suit future applications when required. So we're really trying to drive through the, the benefit of our design experience and design time to gain benefit of that time and time and time again. This actually will help to increase the productivity. So the productivity of our staff throughout the project life cycle improves a standardization and repeatability breed familiarity in the application of the product sets. So as we as we re redeploy the products, we can gain more and more benefit from that. Complex design details or interfacing risks, as I've mentioned already, can be driven out of the products, therefore reducing design risk as the ME systems are designed and installed. So we really focus on those interface details to make sure that the process supports the correct application of the products. A DFMA process does drive early decision making 
which sometimes is at odds with the, the sort of typical or traditional project process. Um, but really, it's all about options around system strategy or equipment being selected, being resolved earlier in the project timeline, before man minimising the risk of redesign at a later date when it becomes more difficult to, to influence change, but equally it has more of a negative impact on the project. So really pushing earlier into the project the, the need to drive decision making. Um, so it's, it's clearly a, a, an influence of the, the process onto the project delivery um, life cycle. So bringing this all together enables earlier cost, cost fixity um, because we, we can actually bring greater knowledge of the design and the procurement methodologies into the project at an earlier stage. Particularly if we go back to the standardization and repeatability benefit, if we're implementing products and methodologies which we are, are aware of and we've, we've used before, then, then we can really start to, to, to be sure in terms of the cost profile of the project at an earlier stage. Internally, we've got this 70-60-30 um, metric. Um, you may have heard about it in the industry, um, and, and there'll be similar similar metrics, which um, I'm, I'm sure the, the industry and our competitors will use. But, but we feel strongly that a manufacturing and technology-led approach to construction does deliver these benefits, and we have we have evidence of, of, of getting to these levels on, on recent projects. So the process should deliver um, an improved level of quality. 70% of our components are manufactured off-site. The measure of that could be um, subject to either by, um, by value or by quantity. By using the process, we actually have seen a 60% reduction in the, the, the labour that's required on-site. So we're gaining productivity gains on-site as a result. Doesn't mean to say that the, the labour uh, requirement across the board will be reduced, but certainly the site-based labour um, requirement will reduce. Um, and it does give an, a, a, an improved positional uncertainty. We can be more sure about how the, the components come together and therefore have more certainty in terms of the, the programme and how, how it all comes together. So that's something that, that we are experiencing. Clients are really keen on um, being able to drive out the risk of their, their overall project because we can deliver it more with a, with a greater degree of certainty. What I'd like to do, um, just to sort of put some of that into context, is just to play a short video to demonstrate um, the process and the products coming to life. Um, and we, from one of our recent projects where we provided uh, a, a key central part of the m &E systems distribution um, within the Henry Royce Institute in Manchester. Uh, I'm going to play this. Hopefully the the sound comes through. Um, if it doesn't, just um, I hope Gonzalo or Joe can let me know. The Henry Royce project is a 16,000 square metre mixed-use building with labs and offices for the University of Manchester. It's one of 10 hub buildings for the Royce across the nation and this is the headquarters. We're succeeding here by working as one team using Select, Expanded, Crown House, the Lango Rourke Group, our geotechnical and piling partners to unlock tight, logistically constrained city Neil. centre sites using everything that the business has got to offer yeah. and it's worked. It stops for me, I don't know if anyone else is experiencing the same. It's, yeah, it doesn't seem to be coming through properly. Yeah, the sound is coming through, but not the image. I don't know, you want to oh, see, start again? So, yeah, apologies, it was coming through perfectly fine for me, so I didn't, I didn't pick that up. Seamlessly. Yeah, now it's working. The Henry Royce project. The 16,000 square metre mixed use building with labs and offices for the University of Manchester. It's one of 10 hub buildings for the Royce across the nation, and this is the headquarters. We're succeeding here by working as one team using Select, Expanded, Crown House, the Lango Rourke Group, our geotechnical and piling partners to unlock tight, logistically constrained city centre sites using everything that the business has got to offer. And it's worked. It's worked seamlessly, but it's a testament to all the upfront planning advice that we've done over an 18-month pre-construction services agreement and maintaining a team that's consistent from bid through to delivery. 
this project is a unique project, not only just for Langerot Group, but also for Crown House Technologies. The service strategy enabled us to develop the mega riser structure, but this is only one part of the project. The whole research facility has been based on giving maximum flexibility for the occupants of the facility. It has been based on giving maximum flexibility for the I think I might be having some technical issues my side. Yeah. Um, did that, uh, I'm guessing that stopped. I, I think I think we can probably push on. Um, it's, uh, it's a shame, but uh, just hold on. Let me let me move through. OK, just bear with me a moment. OK, um, yeah, again, apologies about that. Um, we, it is actually a good video, and, and what it what actually pulls together is the, the demonstration around the, the need to have a, a fully coordinated design um, in sufficient time to manufacture. Um, but equally, the, the, one of the key parts of, of the success of a DFMA process using uh, M&E products is really factoring logistics into the, the approach and the methodology. Um, it may be that you would think that um, Logistics is probably something best left for the, the, the contractor when they come on board at, at contract award point. But really, the, the logistics is, is key to the success of, of a DFMA process and needs to be factored in the, in the early stage design. Um, with that in mind, I, I've got a, a flow, process flow on the on screen, which um, I, I won't go into in a terrible amount of detail, but I'll, I'll sort of pick up on some of the key points. And really, this, this process is is how we currently um, see our um, best methodology of going to work to implement a DFMA process within the m and &E space. Um, really, a key part of success is really during the early design stages to feed in the spatial and logistics requirements. So it's really during REBA stage two and three. Um, ideally, as part of an early engagement um, arrangement with a DFMA specialist, um, and what that enables us to do is to, to design out risk um, during those early stages. So we've got the, the correct level of spatial provision, um, both on plan and in, in, in elevation and section to, to enable the, those modular elements to come together. But uh, probably a, a part of this which, which we're really developing at the moment is um, the sort of thought around configuration rule sets and what are the product rules that, that design teams need to adhere to to not prevent the application of a DFMA process or a MEP offsite product at a later design stage. So those rule sets, design rule sets, um, are really key to, for design teams to understand um, how, the, how the products come together. So really from um, REBA stage four onwards, when the, the contractor is appointed, is when the route to manufacture process kicks in. And this is really about the detailed design for manufacture, um, undertaking the structural validation of the modules, preparing the manufacturing information, and lining up the, um, the our manufacturing facilities to enable the, the feed-in um, feed uh, durations to enable us to manufacture. Typically, we look at 16 weeks in advance of manufacture to, to pre start preparing the information for that to happen. So clearly, it, it throws up the requirement for a completely integrated um, design, delivery and construction program uh, to enable the, the, the right level of information to be flowed through by the right people at the right time. Once we've manufactured and delivered to site, um, we, we then obviously have to ensure that the products that we're putting in place um, are effective and that they are, they are following the right assurance processes. So we've got defined inspection and test processes which, which follow um, which are aligned, sorry, to the M&E um, products. Um, and we also feedback lessons learned into the, the next project to, to enable us to have a, a, a continual development. So this, this process isn't specific to, to ourselves. Um, it's one which, which um, any offsite manufacturer would, would likely um, pose. So it's uh, certainly a, a generic process that, that would ensure a um, an appropriate application of the DFMA process and realisation of off-site MEP products. What I'd like to do now is just touch on some of the benefits of the, the product. So previously I, I, I hinted towards the, um, the process benefits. This is really around the, the products. 
So the benefits of using the products can be summarised in, in the following headings. Um, you gain more control over the critical path by using products that are manufactured off-site because you can decouple the manufacturing from the construction sequence and we can actually facilitate just-in-time delivery of products ready for installation and commissioning. So the impact of um, delayed works on site would be felt less through a, an off-site a strategy because you can also sequence the off-site works to to accommodate any shift in pattern of, of the construction activities. We can improve the, the, the quality um, of the, the final installation um, because in, our, in the manufacturing facilities um, we use manual and automated tooling uh, equipment to help um, establish the, the products or the components within the modules and those are tools which are not typically available on site, um, which wouldn't necessarily realise the same level of um, quality from the, the installation. Um, also, we, we can prepare the equipment and install the equipment within the modules without the constraints that typically experience on site. So if you can imagine you're, you're fitting out a congested plant room or a tight riser um, and you're trying to install some pipe work or containment, Whereas if you're on site, you, you might struggle to, to get access, full access around all points. But in our manufacturing facility, there's space around the products to enable um, our operatives to, to get space, uh, get access to, to the installation from each and every site. So we can be sure that when we're mounting things on uh, on bracketry, for example, that, that it's correctly made and we can we can make sure we can access all parts of the installation. And we have a manufacturing led QA process which enables the, the, the continued improvement of quality. Um, one of the key parts of a, a, an off-site MEP product is it, it enables you to start commissioning early. It enables you to commission or pre-commission parts of the, the system off-site. This will ensure that the systems come together and work more optimally um, at an earlier point in the programme. And it reduces delays on site where uh, faults or um, setup issues are, are, are uncovered within in the factory and dealt with in the factory before um, they reach site. We, we've recently had a, a success story in terms of establishing a, an HV a private ring network on one of our projects where we constructed modular substations in our factory. We connected them all together, tested out the functionality of them without obviously putting the HV power through, but certainly testing the control functionality. Um, and that was all de-risk witnessed by the client before it was shipped to site. So the, the activities on site were, were, were relatively straightforward. We do get a lot of control over how labour is distributed across the project. When, you, when you're using a DFMA process and when you're implementing off-site products, you can play with where the, the labour goes. So the project's labour requirement probably stays similar, but you can split that between the site and factory. And I guess given the, um, the, the context which we're not now all working in and under COVID restrictions, um, the reduction of staff on site will facilitate improve social distancing con conditions to enable our, our staff to, to work safely and effectively. That leads on to employee wellbeing, which, which is improved by the use of off-site MEP products. Um, our operatives are provided a safer environment to work in. Um, any activities which they are undertaking and completing are, are, un are done in a, a more er ergonomic way. Um, therefore, reducing any um, ailments which might come as a result of, of uh, difficult um, or awkward uh, ways of, of install, installing equipment on site. We've got reduced working and height um, uh, condition whereby we, we would use uh, appropriate lifting equipment, appropriate uh, uh, gantries to enable our operatives to access higher parts of the, the products on, on the production line. Um, which would also be more controlled on, on, on site conditions. One of the, the key parts really is that we can offer, through an off-site approach, we can offer a controlled environmental condition for the, the operatives in the factory. So I'm sure you've all been on sites where it's either been cold and windy and wet, or it's been hot and, and quite uncomfortable to, 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 to work in. We um, are in, in, a, in a factory environment. Clearly, we can have a lot of control over how the how the conditions are maintained, and therefore keeping our employees um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a comfortable position. Um, and I guess 
people sometimes like to travel, people sometimes don't like to travel, but certainly a, a lot of our operatives like to, to focus on a single place um, and working in a facility, a manufacturing facility enables um, a, a reduced level of travel for operatives, um, as opposed to all of them having to, to go to site wherever their, their site location might be and, and however far away that might be from home. We are we are uncovering that the, the process and the products do provide a more sustainable way of going to work. We get better use of materials. Um, there's, there's less wastage. We can manage the materials more effectively in the factory environment. We are looking at how we can um, develop the products with uh, reduced embodied carbon content. So looking at alternative materials to remove the steelwork, which would commonly be associated with the, the these type of products in the M&E space. Try really working hard to dispel the understanding of using large metal frames um, in lieu of more modern uh, materials. That, that's a key thing to get a sustainable solution. Um, and finally, um, the process will reduce site traffic, therefore it reduces site emissions. And if you've got a congested um, city centre site, if you can reduce the number of uh, vehicles to and from the site, then clearly it's a, it's a positive position for the, the project to be in. What I'd like to do now is just take a quick run through on some, some typical products which you um, may or may not be aware of. Um, and hopefully this will give you a, an overview in terms of the, the, the scale at which the, the current product range, which you would experience through the likes of ourselves or any of our um, uh, competitors, they, they would be equally capable of providing. When we think about distribution modules, um, typically we've got linear services on floor, which would be delivered through a, a horizontal distribution module. Um, and what we try and do is maximise the, the, the capacity for services within each module. So each module is, is, is being developed to transport as much content, as much value as we can possibly experience. Similarly, for vertical distribution modules, the, the challenge with um, with vertical modules is often that we've got um, health and safety constraints around working in um, open shafts. And if we have a, an offsite MEB product, which we can drop in there through the uh, through a crane or a hoist, or not, not drop in through a hoist, sorry, but certainly drop in through a, with using a crane or, or other means that enables us to establish the content within the riser in a far more safer way of doing so. Plant room modules and skids is a, is a, is a large opportunity for offsite uh, manufacture. Um, you could only imagine the amount of labour and material which would constitute a, a, an energy centre site type plant room, but equally just even a simple pump skid, there's a lot of value to be gained by moving that offsite and gaining the benefit from it. And equally, it doesn't have to be constrained to, to small um, transportable plant rooms. We do have the facility to create larger plant rooms that are all manufactured in the same facility, manufactured in place, and then they're, they're split into modules prior to, to delivery. So essentially you can realize a, a full plant room without having to um, worry about the interfacing between each module, if you like. Volumetric is, is another um, uh, area within the offsite products. Typically, we would know, the, know that being as utility cupboards for residential, um, bathroom pods for residential again, and potentially other, other sectors like healthcare. Um, and as I mentioned before, HVLB substations is, is an area where um, I think the industry is moving um, to develop um, the ability to establish electrical infrastructure through a, an offsite methodology. Not forgetting the fit out, there's a lot of opportunity within the fit out space um, around the, the electrical systems, we can obviously uh, look at modular wiring, um, how the how we can make better use of buzz bars to really kind of try and take the principles of an offsite product um, that would be manufactured in facility um, and apply that to to the site based condition. So essentially taking a lot of the, the, the labour requirement out of traditional wiring, replacing it with the correct specification of a product and therefore gaining productivity as a result. We have um, uh, used quite successfully on, on recent projects terminal unit modules, which are essentially fully developed high level services modules complete with all m and &E, uh, equipment, enabling again the, the rapid establishment of the m and &E systems on the floor plate. Um, and, and clearly um, that, that would extend to uh, sanitary wear and, and plumbing where we can have 
um, fully assembled uh, integrated pre-plumbed assemblies, which can be modular in, in their nature, or they can be shipped as a, a larger component to site. So that's giving you a bit of an overview in terms of the, the products. What, what I'd like to do now is just hand over to Joe, who's going to provide an overview of how we use digital engineering in the development of the fabrication information for manufacture. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, all. Oh, there's some feedback there, yeah, Neil. Do you mind going on mute for us? Sure. Let's see if yeah. that helps. There we go. Yeah, good afternoon, all. Um, some familiar faces in the chat, so hello, everyone. Uh, and a really good turnout, so thanks very much for joining us. Uh, hopefully you can join us in the coming weeks for the next couple of sessions as well. Um, so, you know, Neil's introduced a lot of the products and stuff that we manufacture in Lango Raw across the business, um, and specifically for Crown House Technologies, this, um, you know, relates to the pipes and the wires, as some like to call it, or the, um, the building services. Um, and I've got a few slides really just giving you a, a bit of an example of what's involved in the design and the coordination. Um, and in today's process, uh, and over the, the next few sessions, we're also then going to talk about what's coming in the future, um, some of the ideas of ours and the technology that we're going to hopefully introduce in the future. So um, the image that you can see there is taken from one of our packaged plant rooms, which you just saw in the real world example in Neil's slides there. As you can see, this, the model that we produce here is fully detailed. And essentially what we do in our team is, is produce these things virtually before we actually construct them. Um, and it's, you know, selecting the actual manufacturer products, even down to the nuts and the bolts, literally, um, before we manufacture that to enable our manufacturing centre to, to build these things. Um, next slide, please, Neil. Um, so this is just another example of some of the information that we produce. So this is a, an installation drawing, a set out drawing. So you can see uh, we're literally detailing absolutely every component there, what it is, and also the setting out information to enable our site teams to construct these things. Next slide, please, Neil. And here is an example of a, a suite of drawings that we produce for every single module. So every single module that goes into our factory, we produce a full set of information, as you can see here. Um, you know, and it's literally again every, every component that goes into this is fully detailed, scheduled out. Um, and you know, you can imagine the, the quantity of these drawings we produce is vast. I think we produce in excess of about five thousand of these drawings a year, so quite a large operation. Um, next slide, please, Neil. Um, so yeah, if you, could you just drop out of presentation mode for a second, Neil, and just orbit around this? So um, this is typically, uh, so this is for a plant room, um, and this is typically the information that we receive or is produced by our design partners. Um, and um, so Neil, would you mind just orbiting around that? I don't know, I can't see that at the moment. Yeah, it's coming through my screen, apologies. Oh, um, yeah, it's, maybe it's frozen there. I'll, 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 I'll unshare and try again. Yeah, OK, no problem. Um, for a plan, there you go, I can see that now, Neil. Would you mind just orbiting around that 3D file? So you can see there that this is sort of a, a design intent for a plant room. So that a, a plant room, for those of you who might not be building services engineers, um, you know, typically boilers, pumps, all the stuff that makes the building go, circulating water, heating it around the building, etc. So that's to the extent that we... Oh, hang on a second, I've just lost my monitor. This is going well, isn't it? Here we go, there we go, back again. So this is to the, yeah, the extent that we receive information. Um, and, and to be honest, I've picked a particularly un well-developed one, not naming any names, uh, but joking aside, it, it's just to demonstrate really in a second that um, the, the skill set that we have in, in a DE team in Crown House is a lot different from what you'd expect, you know, in a designer. So if you go to the next slide now, please, Neil. So what you could see there was the what we get from a designer. And then this is in reality what is needed to actually manufacture this thing. So that is the same plant room but at a manufacturing level of detail. And you can see there, there's a lot more required to actually manufacture this thing than there is from, from the design. So that's, you know, typically if, if you ever work with Crown House, this is what our DE team do. And this is probably why if you're a consultant, they're always on your backs about making sure that we've got enough space to, to put this in and put that in. Um, but it's just to highlight here that the skill set is very different. Um, and I think, uh, this is where I think as an industry we need to just be better aligned and a bit smarter when we work you know that we need to just stick what to what we're good at really um, and 
as Neil sort of alluded to, if we are going to manufacture buildings in this way, you know, our team that develop this sort of stuff need to be involved as early as possible to make, as a consultant, as an advisor, to make sure that, you know, certain key requirements are actually being met. And we're actually thinking about this at the beginning rather than trying to shoehorn it in at the end because it, it just doesn't work properly and uh, yeah ends up costing loads more money and more time etc uh next slide please now okay so this is um essentially what we've done here is we've we've collected the design model for a healthcare facility which as you probably know is probably the most one of the co most complex ones that we have to deal with um and you can see, so what we've done is ingested all of the design models that we get from our design partners and our design centers into a big database, essentially just trying to analyze, you know, what, a what makes up a design. So you can see here, we're, you know, close to a million components that go into our hospital, just in the design. We don't even draw a lot of this stuff. So in reality, there's probably quite a lot more, but it's just to highlight here that, um, in the context of the wider industry, building services is by far the most complex. And I think people underestimate you know, certainly uh, architects and structural engineers don't quite comprehend how complex building services is and the amount of stuff. If you look at the component count at the bottom there, sort of architectural, they're talking about 70,000, maybe 100,000 for FF and E, structures 20,000 compared to like, you know, nearly three quarters of a million components going into building services. So this is just highlighting really that, you know, it is very complex. And this is kind of leading on to some of the sessions we're going to go do next time. Um, it just essentially what we need to do here is sort of get together as an industry and uh, really understand how do we face this, you know, tackle this challenge. And I think really the, the key here is the standardization and repeatability. Um, you know, we need to really try and modularize as much as possible and then repeat use of, you know, pump skids, plant rooms, etc. We need to really, really as an industry, really start thinking about this because you know, we are probably the most complex out of all of them. And uh, yeah, we face the most challenges. So that's, uh, but yeah, we'll talk about that in the next sessions if you uh, if you join. So uh, yeah, over to, back to you, Neil. Thanks, Joel. Um, now, this is the, the last part of the, the presentation on the first session. Um, what I wanted to do was to show a video. Um, given the success of the video at the start, um, I'm not sure how successful this one will be. Um, I, I will give it a shot. Um, if it doesn't work, um, and without giving too much away of the video, um, just to introduce it, it's, it's really related to, or going back to the, the point I made as I was explaining the product about how, how we can establish a, a full energy centre or large scale plant room through our uh, through an offsite approach through a DFMA process and using offsite products. This is a, an image of um, the energy centre at um, Manchester Airport, which we recently completed. Um, and, and it was made in our facility in Albury and brought together in um, modular components. I think there was five, um, five parts to this, this, um, this overall energy centre, which were brought together and in, 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 in pretty much in the, the same day to establish the, the, the facility um, quite quickly. Uh, I will play the video. Hopefully it works. Um, if it doesn't work, if Joe, maybe if you just let me know if it's, it's coming through glitchy, then I'll, I'll just um, move on to the next part.
Okay, so um, that's us now at the, the end of our um, presentation. Um, hopefully it's uh, given you some pause for thought. Hopefully it's been helpful. Um, I think if we've also got some opportunity for questions now and I'll let, I'll let Gonzalo moderate that. But before he does that, I just want to thank you all for, for allowing us the time to present to you. Um, and if anyone has any um, wishes to explore this in any greater detail with us, then more than happy to, to facilitate that. Um, perhaps uh, Gonzalo can enable the, the connections to be made. Um, yeah, again, appreciate your time and look forward to your, your questions, if there are any. Yeah, I think the first question is, yeah, what modeling software did you use in the example and any modeling guideline standards adopted in the example? So what Joe, you mentioned is Revit mainly. You're in yeah, M primarily kind. Revit. M most of this, yeah, the models that we have, um, you know, both from what we get from our design partners and what our own internal design centers use is Revit. Um, in terms of standards, there's, there's so many, they're not really standards anymore, if I'm being honest. Um, we just, we certainly do try and follow you know all the British standards where where suitable. Um, and that's that's about as much as. Otherwise, we'll be going forever talking about standards. But uh, yeah, primarily Revit. Okay, next one. How and when in the process do you engage with the specialist CDP systems of contractors to incorporate their specific requirements? Um, I, I can take that one. I think um, it, it depends on the relationships that we've got with the specific. Um, specialist contractors we we have got a lot of internal capability to enable us to bring the knowledge into the design um, we've got internal capability from um, covering all systems so we we cover it off in that sense so it doesn't preclude us from uh, having procurement flexibility at a point down the line but clearly um, clearly there's there's a need to bring um, specialists into the project early on so we can incorporate uh, their requirements um, into the process. I, I, th I think the, the ability for the project to enable us to bring specialists on board earlier only means that you get a better product at the end. Um, but I think Joe kind of made the point about um, DFMA consultancy, if you like. I, I think there's there's absolutely space in the project lifecycle. And we, we, have, we have seen it recently through our engagements that um, a DFMA specialist being brought into a project during the early stages, not necessarily down as a a person to deliver the project, but certainly somebody with knowledge of manufacturing and delivery really does drive really great value into a project um, and enables a lot of the decisions which might be um, uh, be required to be made early on in the process. It, it enables that to happen to bring, so bringing somebody in early, not just the CDB specialist, but equally the, the delivery uh, person or people involved would, would, would certainly help the success of a project. Next one, to improve the wider industry and limit pockets of excellence, how do you propose consultants can get closer to developing the fabrication specialism that your D team has? Uh, this one, you don't mind if I can say something about this one. I'm, we are working at the moment. We are working together with with Lang Rock on exploring this, how we can make this better. To be honest, as a consultant, it really is really frustrating when you do a design and the first thing that a contractor do is well throw it in the bin and start from scratch. We definitely need to get much better and better at this. Also, at the same time, if uh, the main point is making some decisions early about how to use this product, but really, really early in the design stage, like for, from stage two, because then if you build that into the design, then obviously the contractor will pick that up and it will be so much easier to do. And now, Neil, Joe, do you have any more to add to this one? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it's all about you know being us being involved early and just talking you know just making those allowances if, if we're going to go down this route of modularization you just there's certain things you need to think about beforehand um, and also you know we, we we're, we're happy to share with people like um, our DE team we've got a load of guidance documents that we're happy to share with anyone who wants them um, just around spatial so early stage spatial requirements for frames and and fixings and stuff like that. We're, we're more than happy to share all of those. It's no problem. And I think that it's just a collaboration. We just need to have an alliance really and just upskill the whole industry across the board. I think we, we've also got to recognise that um, different individuals and different um, organisations within the project lifecycle will have different skill sets. 
Um, and I think probably what we need to do, we need to apply the right skills at the right point in the, in the, the project. Um, it, so picking up really, it, it really does benefit from having the right people doing the right thing at the right time. Um, and that leads you towards a bit more of a blended process where you are perhaps um, from a DE perspective, you would maybe as a consultant um, uh, take ownership of certain parts of the, the modelling and maybe as a specialist uh, delivery organisation, the contractor might take ownership of other parts. So therefore, the, the relevant skills and expertise can be applied in the right places to avoid the, the condition that we experience at the moment where the consultant's design model is 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 good for coordination, but typically as a contractor, it doesn't give us the, the level of depth that we need. So we typically have to, to draw over or, or restart. So we need to get to that position where we, we have the blended process using the skills and expertise at the right points during the, during the project. Uh, next one. Have you thought about including other disciplines in your prefabrication strategy, such as elevators or escalators? Uh, the, answer, the answer is yes, but we probably can't go into that in detail. We've got R&D projects which which do uh, talk ab about that. So um, we uh, we absolutely want to um, change the way in which we deliver a project from being a construction based methodology to being an assembly based methodology using technicians to enable us to have a more safer and rapid um, site based um, realization. So any opportunity we have for modularization is being looked at. Um, and, 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 and their systems being developed to, to accommodate those areas such as elevators and escalators, as, as is mentioned. There is another one here, which is more for me. So is the people who joined this event are also pre-registered for the other two? And the answer is no. So the link, the Eventbrite link is the same, but you need to sign up individually for the <laughs> other two events. So yes, please make sure if you are interested in attending, make sure to do so. <clears throat> uh, very good presentation. Uh, have have you carried out any white papers on the benefits of modularization that you can share? I think yeah. you have quite a lot on, on that. So uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it's come from Gavin. So nice to hear from you, Gavin. It's been a, it's been a while. I think Gavin actually gave me my introduction to offsite manufacture on on previous projects. So I know um, I know him well, and I know why. Um, why you'd be asking the question, and because and, his, his company Mercury are on a similar journey to 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 we are. Um, I think being honest, Gavin, the um, the industry needs to get our get our hands around the the benefits. Um, so while we've got internal metrics and assessments that we've made, I think as a whole industry we need to sort of try and bring this together. We we are funding um, research internally, which once ready will be able to be communicated to the industry around the benefits, um, particularly around um, sustainability, which is, a, which is a key part at the moment, um, and the, 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 the labour distribution as a result. So we, we've measured projects to get benefits. We've not really documented those for external as yet, but there, I'm sure through the, the, the uh, research that we're undertaking at the moment, there will be a point at time in the future where that will come out into the industry. Next one I think is more for Joe, is about the level of detail, LOD for TFMA recommended and minimum needed. Yep, so again, with the with so many standards out there, they're, they're not really standards anymore. It depends which one you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about the, the one the MBS developed with the one, two, three, four, five, obviously it's, it's five, it's suitable for, for manufacture. Um, if it's the LOD, I forget what they're all called, but the, the one that's 100, 200, 300, etc. I think it's 400, which is suitable for, manu, for, for manufacture. In reality, I don't think it really matters. I think it just needs to be, you know, you need to have selected the specific products that are going in, made sure that, you know, we know what products are going in, how big they are, etc. And we've the fully coordinated with all the bracketry and stuff like that. But it, it's just common sense, really. I'd, yeah, yep. it's yeah, suitable for, for manufacture. Next one. Are there rules of thumb, let's say, for facilitating the FMA? A guide you follow, perhaps? Yep. Uh, there are rules of thumb, um, and, and those cover multi-discipline, multi-products. Um, I think, as, as we probably experienced with our, the building up of m and &E designs where we might follow rules of thumb, it, it only gets you so far. And I think the benefit is when you actually start to embed the expert knowledge, the subject area knowledge. So um, 
I think we we would always be keen advocates to to bring in the right people to inform the, the process. But I understand during early stage designs, we, we do need an element of um, spatial planning, which could be generated as a result of rules of thumb. So we, we do have those to enable uh, design teams to progress solutions to not preclude the FMA system. There are two levels of rules of thumb. For one, for early, early stage of the design, but having some allowances that would work for any type of product, any type of manufacturer. For example, you go to bathroom pods, it's not the same if they are fabricated by by Langerock or if they are fabricated there. For example, there are quite a lot of factories in Italy. They have the detail requirements are slightly different. So obviously the, the main idea is to have some initial rules of thumb early design stages that then you can accommodate any detailed requirements afterwards. So Next one, how to demonstrate the value add at the front end bidding stage to clients to support the investment? Um, okay, I'll take that one. I, I think it, it really depends on what the client drivers are. Um, we've had projects recently where we've been able to demonstrate through our process that we can deliver quicker. So some clients would see value in having their asset established quicker, perhaps because it enables them to to borrow um, and their borrowing costs are, are, are reduced, or it might enable them to, particularly in a residential context, they might be able to start renting or selling their apartments quicker. So there's value associated with that. Um, I think there's also experience we've gained in terms of um, value through optimizing the, the footprint of facilities. So if we're able to um, optimize the distribution of M&E services that, that helps to create space um, for other uses within the space. So again, that might be value um, the, the client may, may want to see. So it really depends on what the client drivers are um, in terms of how the value is experienced. Um, hopefully that hopefully that responds to the question. So the next one is quite an interesting one about CDM and health and safety, obviously, because you mentioned about when you start the prefabrication of modules in very tight spaces, which might not be possible to affect on site, but that is still you have the CDM requirements for the commissioning, demolition, replacement activities, which must be able to be done safely. So, yeah, well, I think the, the design would always have to be undertaken to enable um, the, the access to services, both from a, a maintenance and demolition or deconstruction perspective when installed in situ. So the, the requirements for space probably wouldn't differ too much um, between the off-site methodology and the, and the on-site methodology. I think that the point I was trying to make, maybe I didn't make it that well enough, but but really if you've got um, if you've got open space around all parts of the module, it enables you to gain access from other parts, which you may, may be prohibited on site. So I think we 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 don't have a, a differing set of um, requirements to achieve. We've got the same requirements, but perhaps just the way in which we get to that point is, is a little bit easier because we've got um, access um, which wouldn't normally be obtained on site. Do these workflows affect building inspection procedures? Um, they shouldn't do. They, they should. Um, I think the, from a compliance perspective, we, we, we don't have any differing um, requirements. In fact, we might even have additional compliance uh, requirements depending on the type of product we're making. Um, we, we will still have to adhere to standard um, project related um, governance. Well, one of them that might be affected is for, from the witnessing point of view, from the client team witnessing point of view, yeah, that some of it might be done in the factory. But yeah, that, that, that's correct. There might be a, a redistribution of, of witnessing and that, that might have a potential cost depending on uh, frequency of visits and location of visits. Also, for early engagement, what is the demarcation responsibilities? For example, MVP consultants undertake in design and calculations. Was with your engagement, Crown uh, House designers develop the drawings. Who does what? Who does what to get the best possible results from your past experience? I think this goes quite a bit into the next session. The next session, to be honest. But Neil or I think, you? Yeah, I think I think from my perspective, um, the. It's going back to the point about using the right skills in the right areas. And I think the, the consultants um, clearly are, are the specialists for performance and system specification. Um, and perhaps um, ourselves as a, an offsite manufacturer, we, we've got more 
experience and, and skill set within um, drawing and detailing. So it's really about having the right um, selection of responsibilities. And I think generally, if we could, as an industry, be in a position where um, the value gain from having a consultant on board is through the, the right specification and performance and, and the consultant owned that, then the, the delivery part of the, the, the project team would, would take ownership of the, the drawing. Um, there, there's there's a blend to this that, 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 that we have got um, we've got arrangements detailed that, that demonstrates that blend, but but clearly it's it's related to sector and uh, project team mix. Are there any benchmarks you could say which will identify the right construction method depending on the project and client drivers? Uh, probably goes back to the point earlier on about the the benefits. I think the um, the industry we need to we need to come together and, and, and document those as, across the board. Um, we have the our, our own benchmarks, which I shared earlier on, the 70, 60, 30 methodology, which, which does translate through to project value. Um, I think in terms of a ready reckoner tool, which Sean is looking for, um, we, don't, we don't really have something like that. It's really gained through, through uh, collaboration and understanding the project value and drivers before being able to determine the 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 successful adopt if, if it's suitable for adoption of a of a DFMA process. For example, the earlier on you are in the project, the more able you would be to maximize the value um, than if you picked up a stage four B level design. Uh, do Langor or Crown House offer industry or SIPC tours of their offsite facilities? I'm sure we, we could if, if people wanted to, yeah. We could arrange yeah. that. If anyone wants to tour we could get in touch we can take them around yeah absolutely once this pandemic is gone and things are back to yeah. normal yeah, yeah. see touch wood uh, to what extent do you need to consider the transportation at the time of design do you for example do you need to consider vibration and external forces for transportation where otherwise you wouldn't have needed to and how much for example does a prefabricated plant room need to be inspected and checked on delivery that all elements have not been affected in transport. OK, um, there's probably two parts to that. There, there would be the, um, the the building level design or there'd be the, the product level design. So if we look at the product level design, first and foremost, the um, our framing designs and um, how we um, coordinate the services within the module, um, we apply temporary conditions against those, whether it's through lifting and shifting in our manufacturing facility, whether it's through logistics to get to site, whether it's through lifting and shifting once on site, all of those temporary conditions are assessed. And if, if there's a need for temporary support or um, any mechanisms to enable the, the, the robustness of that product to be maintained, those are designed into the product um, before, it's, before it's manufactured effectively during the fabrication design stage. Um, we, we do have a, a robust QA process, so when the, when the products leave the factory, the, the condition of it is known and it's checked off when it's received to site. Um, so the, there should be management of that within, within our business. I, th I think from a Langerot perspective, we, because we own the manufacturing, the logistics and the, the delivery parts of the, the organisation, we're able to control that pretty well. Um, we're able to have control over how we make it, how we deliver it and how we install it. So it, it really helps to have that vertically integrated methodology as well. On the transportation side of things, I think that's another point why it's really important to get the contractors engaged early because different contractors have different logistics, preferred logistics procedures. So then obviously sometimes you have to, if the contractors don't get involved until stage 4B, what could happen that you need to change the, the design needs to be changed to adjust to the preferred logistics method? Yeah, I've just realised, Gonzalo, I didn't, actually, I didn't actually state the second point of my two point answer. So um, the, um, the the second point is the, the building level design. So if you're pulling together a, a, an architectural structural m and &E design for a project, which you've earmarked for having the application of offsite, um, products, whether it's um, structural or M&E um, or architectural products, the, the logistics part is, is critical um, and the, you need to detail each relative, uh, each appropriate discipline to accommodate the, the products from the, the other disciplines, if you like. So detailing a structure to accommodate 
a module. It's, it's important to get that in early doors so we can get that um, costed and accounted for equally um, looking at logistics in terms of how the, the products will move through the construction site in a temporary condition to make sure that we've got the right detailing of um, structural loading, for example, if we're bringing through a heavy M&E module and skids. Um, so all of these, these parts we do need to factor in a temporary condition, which is really why the there's a, there's a need within a project life cycle to bring in bring in the delivery experts to to help influence the development of the the building design. Next one, do you get involved at design stage four A, or when the contractor is appointed to produce the work in coordination drawings? Uh, tr traditionally, yeah, it would be from four well beyond four A, so four B. But I think you know, more and more we're sort of ha more than happy to be involved a lot early under a PCSA or you know, pre-construction services agreement. So we can get involved earlier. And that's, I think you've already mentioned it, Neil. More in the early stages, more of just like a, a buildability or like manufacturing consultant, just so things are thought about. You know, if the, the strategy is set early, um, not necessarily doing the production of the drawings, although we can do and we have done in the past, very early stages producing, you know, early stage drawings to for spatial fit etc yeah, yeah. yeah we have we have on recent projects been involved as early as reba stage two um in the capacity that joe mentioned where we're, we're employed as a consultant and we we help to drive in the buildability benefits into the scheme not not just through using off-site products but equally through um through general buildability advice and and we found on those projects they are they're a lot more seamless in terms of the the risks that you uncover at later stages so we we, we have found that by uh, by bringing in that that level of knowledge into into the project team it, it certainly helps so i think the sweet spot would probably be stage three for a, for a level of appointment through a, a bit of a pcsa where, where we're starting to look at the spatial and drawn drawn parts of the, the project design yeah i completely agree with that one and we will touch on that as well in the next session uh next one good have you considered how a smaller scale projects could benefit from dfma do you envisage offering off the pack solutions which can be utilized by others in the industry there's two questions sorry um i think the answer would be yes we have considered that um the the businesses and I'm speaking from Langer Orc as a, a specific response to this one, that the business is looking at how we can have an external face on product sale. Um, clearly, there's a lot of challenge around that. Um, but there are there are, um, there are are manufacturers out there um, who make the type of products that, that, that we've demonstrated through this presentation who are not contractors. So we can, as an industry, we can deploy product sets without really going to a manufacturer like Langerork or a manufacturer delivery organization like Langerork. So um, certainly the likes of Armstrong make packaged plant rooms. Um, so they're off the peg solutions, if you like. Okay. I think that was the last question. I don't know if anybody else, we have some more time if anybody else has more questions. I think we are there. So yeah, thank you very much everybody for joining and hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Definitely the next one to me, I think I'm really, it's probably my favorite one and the one I'm more interested in and more passionate about. I think it's definitely we need to make sure to that the industry evolves because at the moment, sometimes in the construction industry, we, it, it seems that we're still using all the old methods or trying to uh, we are yeah we maybe we use off offside fabric fabric prefabricated solutions but we also need to change the way we think not only just using the product but change, changing the way we think to make all the process smoother and better so i think that is probably yeah for me definitely my favorite one neil and joe yeah no pressure <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't know if we should take that as an insult, Gonzalo. Given the, given I've, I've just presented this one, but <laughs> the next one's really Joe, and, and I, would, I would definitely echo Gonzalo's thoughts. I think the um, the forward look of the industry is is really um, exciting, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to showcase some approaches and uh, technologies and tools that that will will really get the um, your creative juices flowing.
So yeah, thank you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, and let's see you 